والمرسلين أما بعد I was going to ask for some water but I don't think that's an option especially الحمد لله there's a uh, last Ramadan there's a uh, the scholar he was doing a talk it's, Ramadan just started and it happened to be the first day of Ramadan so during the talk he's talking about Ramadan and fasting and virtues and the bottle is there from the day before he picks up and starts drinking and he doesn't realize right? and he's drinking and nobody's telling him as well subhanallah and then he remembers after the after the talks over he said oh Ramadan I'm supposed to be fasting May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our fast May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us all the the opportunity to repent to him to accept our tawbah and the small deeds that we do uh, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them into mountains I'd like to begin by first of all uh, thanking and showing appreciation to Adira Masjid, you guys for attending, uh, the management, our dear Imam Shaykh, Mawlana Abdul Hakim Sab, Mawlana Abdul Rashid Sab, for arranging and making this a success. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you guys as well. We all have regrets in life. We all have things that we wish we started earlier, <coughs> things we, we wish that we did better or we had done in different ways right perhaps for many of us it's the regret of I wish I started revising earlier I wish I started concentrating on my career earlier I wish I started my weight loss diet earlier right so we all have these regrets that I wish I did something different I wish I did things in a different way earlier Right? Or I wish I, I some some of us might have regret. I wish that you know I started practicing Islam earlier. My family would probably be different now. Right? But all of these are regrets, right? And they all come back to the idea of I wish. I wish I had done so uh, earlier. Today's talk and the entire uh, story of <coughs> the tawbah, the repentance of Kaab bin Malik, the great Sahabi. The whole thing is about this. I wish I had done things differently. Or I wish I had prepared earlier. Now this relates to us directly. Why? Because we also go through the same emotions, the same kind of incidents in our life where we regret delaying something. Now, it's a story that's based on I wish I had made the changes. I wish I had done things earlier. Right? But... As we get into Ramadan, perhaps we'll finish Ramadan with the same kind of regrets. Perhaps we finish last Ramadan with the same kind of regret. I wish, you know, I did Ramadan better, so it's nearly past. But, but it's not too late. If the first week of Ramadan wasn't so great, we still have three more weeks. Yeah? We still have three more weeks to make the changes. Now, I want to take you back to the time of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the ninth year of Hijrah. It's the summer, and as you know, the summer in the desert, in Arabia, it's, it's very difficult, right? The heat burns you, yeah? it burns you. It burns, if you've been Umrah, you know the heat in Mecca, Medina, it burns you when you feel it. And you can't wait to jump back into the AC. Yeah? You go back to your hotel and go back. Nobody goes out apart from the uh, cleaners during the day it's very difficult so it's the summer the most the best kind of uh, comfort that anyone can afford is the shade and some you know cool water that's the best comfort that you can have but despite this the leader of the city messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he has other plants right the fruits and the trees the plants it's ripe they're ripe to pick Right? Nobody wants to go out. But the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa has other plans. His plan is for the Muslims to head out in the heat, in the thirst, right, with the difficulties, and to travel 350 miles towards the northwestern of Arabia. Right? 350 miles to travel and not just to travel for sightseeing or just to travel for the sake of it but to travel with an army and to travel and to go and fight 
This is the plans of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a time where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells all able fighting men to prepare themselves and to prepare themselves properly. Right? To prepare themselves properly. Right? And every single Muslim man prepares himself with whatever preparation they can do. The only people who stay back are the hypocrites. There's about 80 or so of them. And if, not even all the hypocrites. Even some of the hypocrites, they live with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But 80 or so hypocrites, they stay behind. And apart from them, a few men who uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself said, told to stay behind. Like Ali radiallahu anhu. Right? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Ali, you stay behind. And you're going to be, the, you're going to be in charge of Medina. Right? While I'm away. And you have to take care of Medina. Besides these, there are three men. Three Sahaba. And not just, you know, just Sahaba who were maybe you know, new to Islam. Sahaba who were with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, in all the difficulties. One of them is the Sahabi Hilal bin Umayyah. It's another Sahabi, Mirara ibn Rabi'ah. The third Sahabi, and the narrator of t our story today is the Sahabi by the name of Ka'ab bin Malik. Now who's Ka'ab bin Malik? Ka'ab bin Malik was originally from Medina. So he was an Ansari. Right? Ka'ab bin Malik was amongst those Sahaba who met the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the Prophet Sallallahu came to Medina. We know before the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to Medina, two years before, 12 Sahaba, they went to Mecca, they heard of um, the messenger in, Medi in Mecca, so they went from Medina, 12 of them, and they went, okay, let's go find out about him. And they accepted Islam, and they gave uh, the pledge to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The next year, 72 or 73 men and women from Medina, they go to, again during the Hajj time, to Mecca. Right? Two or three women and 17 men or, or, or men. This is known as the Pledge of Aqaba. The Pledge of Aqaba. What was it that they pledged? They pledged to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Ya Rasulullah, you come to Medina and we're going to host you. We're going to protect you. We're going to give you an abode. And this is something that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was looking for. This is why he went to Taif first. And in Taif, he wasn't successful. So he was looking for an abode. And it was these brave men who invited the Messenger Sallallahu said, you come to Medina and we, we will make you our leader. And you're going to live in security and peace. So Ka'b bin Malik was amongst these people who, who was part of this Aqaba. And Ka'b bin Malik, he was quite proud of this. Apart from this, when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi came to uh, Medina, Ka'b bin Malik was always with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in all of his difficult times. The most difficult times are times of, uh, of the battles, the expeditions. Right? You know someone really loves you when they are with you in your difficult times. Otherwise everyone's with you when you're going through good times and ease. Right? But those who stick with you during the difficult times, you have trust in them. So Kaaba was part of all these events, apart from the uh, Battle of Badr. Now, in the Battle of Uhud, uh, when the, the, uh, the, the Muslims came to Medina, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he created the Brotherhood. Now, he joined the Muslim, a Muslim man from Mecca and a Muslim man from Medina and made them into brothers, that you to take care of each other. So Ka'ab bin Malik, he was made brothers with Zubair bin Awam. Zubair bin Awam. Now, in the Battle of Uhud, Ka'ab bin Malik, he fought bravely. He fought like, you know, a warrior. Right? And at the end of the battle, when they found Ka'ab, they discovered that he had 17 stab wounds. 17 stab wounds in him. Right? Now, the Muslims, they thought that, okay, Ka'ab is, is breathing his last breath and he's about to pass away. But Ka'ab, you know, by the will of Allah, he recovered. Right? The idea is, what I'm trying to picture, the picture I'm giving you is that Ka'ab bin Malik was from the great Sahaba. He was always with the Messenger Sallallahu Everyone knows Hassan bin Thabit. 
that he was the point of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As well as Hassan bin Thabit, Ka'ab was also one of the great poets, and he was he would compile poetry in the life of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He would often defend the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, praise him and defend him. And you know, one kind of defense is a physical defense, but another defense that we can all do of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam of Islam is to speak about it, to defend Islam, to speak about it. Right? And to teach it. And this is something that we should do. So Ka'ab was someone that was with the Messenger وسلم, He defended him physically and he defended him with his words. Right? And after Ka'ab bin Maliki, uh, um, you know, after the Messenger وسلم, he continued to compose poetry in praise of Islam and wisdom of the Messenger. Now, Ka'ab bin Malik, he had a son, uh, he had many sons. One of them was called Abdullah bin Ka'ab. Abdullah bin Ka'ab. So he narrates the story, he says, my father Ka'ab bin Malik, when he lost his sight, when he became old and he lost his sight, he, Ab Abdullah bin Ka'ab, his son would take him around, he was his guide, he was, who would take care of him. So he says that my father, he narrated to me the story of when he stayed behind. Right? Now, when we look into the historical sources, like the Al-Isaba, Fi Tamiz Sahaba of Ibn Hajar, Imam Ibn Hajar, he mentions that Ka'ab bin Malik, he died somewhere in the reign of uh, Sayyidina Muawiyah in Sham, in Syria area. And it was in his time where he became really old and he lost his sight, he became blind. Right? So he says uh, to his uh, son, he, says, he tells his son that, he begins the story. He says, I never stayed behind in any expedition that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out in, apart from uh, Tabuk, our uh, today's story, and Badr. In regards to Badr, he says that it wasn't expected of Muslims to leave. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never, he didn't go out with the intention to fight a battle. Right? He went to go and, you know, to uh, uh, encounter a caravan, and that was it. Right? But it was an expectation, expectation of all the Muslims to leave. In regards to Tabuk, he says that this was the only time where he stayed behind from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, Ka'ab bin Malik, he says that when he came to the battle of Tabuk and the Muslims were preparing, he says, I was never in a better state financially. I was never more physically, more stronger. There was never a time where he had, you know, two horses or two rides, right? We have one car and we're very happy. Imagine you have two cars and three cars, right? So he said, I never, there was never a time where I had two cars apart from this. It was around this time where I was, you know, Ka'ab bin Malik. What's also to mention is that Ka'ab bin Malik originally was for a time was from the Ashabu Sufa. He was from the people who, well, you can say the, they were sort of homeless and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would host them in the Masjid. But after this Ka'ab bin Malik, his financial state became better improved, right? To the extent where he owned two uh, horses and two rides. So Ka'ab says, you know, I was in possession of two rides. So he had, he had everything that he needed to go out. He had no excuses. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he set out on this expedition in extremely hot season. The journey was long, difficult, right? You're crossing the desert. Right? Just recently, some, uh, this year I think, uh, some brothers from the UK, they, they wanted to walk the, the Sira, uh, the Hijra path. So they walked from Mecca to Medina in the heat, in the desert. Right? And they documented the entire journey. Right? Why they did it, you know, just to document, just to make uh, raise awareness of this. But the idea is that they, they went through a lot of difficulties. And this is only from Mecca to Medina. Right? Where the path is not so, it's not a, a strange path, it's you know, where people don't go. It's, it's a path that people tread. Yet, despite this, it's still a difficult path. Now imagine going in a path which isn't normally, you know, it's not so busy. Right? You don't have the same kind of, uh, you don't know the path as well. So, it was waterless, difficult, and it was a time where uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the Muslims exactly where they're going. It was the, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's habit that he wouldn't tell Muslims when he was going on an expedition, he wouldn't tell him exactly where he's going or his exact plans. He would say maybe we're going in a, this direction, but you know, not, a, not exactly that. Right? He'd say we're going towards this direction. Right? Why would he do this? Just so you know, news can't spread. Uh, people don't become, you know, these, uh, people don't spread the exact news, the plans of the Messenger But when he came to Tabuk, 
right? When it came to this incident, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam told the Muslims exactly where they're going. He told them exactly how to, uh, what to equip themselves with. And he told them of his plans. Why? So they could prepare themselves mentally, physically, and they could prepare for this journey. Right? So the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he prepared with him about 30,000 uh, men. And this incident took place just before the battle of, uh, the conquest of Mecca. 30,000 men, they prepared themselves. And before this, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he also had invited the tribes of Arab, the Arab tribes, the non-Muslim tribes to join. He said, join me. Why? Because there was a danger from the, uh, the, the Byzantines that they would come and attack the whole of Arabia. Right? But the Arab tribes, they, didn't, they weren't interested and they didn't accept the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, okay, I'm going to live with the Muslims. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he left with the Muslims. Now, the army was so large that if someone wanted to hide, they could hide. Right? You could get away with it. Right? Unless Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed uh, an ayah to expose those who stayed behind, you could hide. And that's what people were, some of the hypocrites were hoping that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wouldn't know. Right? There's 30,000 people, how, you, how are you going to remember? You're busy with so many things, how are you going to remember anything? Right? So you can go and hide. Now the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he would, every day he was, you know, uh, encouraging the Muslims, prepare yourself, prepare yourself, and everyone is preparing themselves. Everyone is getting ready. Just before the Ramadan started, you go to the market, you go to Worldwide Cash and Carry and Medina Cash and Carry, you see it's busy. Everyone's there picking up the same stuff. They need to keep, you know, everyone's doing the same kind of preparation. It's happening, right? So the whole of Medina is preparing themselves, buying you know, the equipment, the food that they need for this. Now, Kaab bin Malik, he himself would leave in the morning, make plans that today I need to prepare myself. Just like everyone else is preparing themselves, I also need to prepare myself. Right? He would leave in the morning and he would come back in the evening and he's not done anything yet. Right? Sometimes we open up our work, we sit there, say, okay, just I just need to one, need to check one thing, then I'll come back to it. I need to check one thing, I'll come back to it. Oh, you know what? There's only 20 minutes left. I'll just take a break for 20 minutes, I'll come back to it in 20 minutes. And like this, the whole day will go and we've not really even made a start on our work. The same thing would happen with Ka'b bin Malik. Every morning he would leave and say, you know what, uh, uh, I've only got to prepare for myself. It's going to take me you know, a few hours. I'll do it. You know, okay, I didn't do it. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And like this, the days went by. And this also tells you something actually. The, the Sahaba, they were great men. Greatest, the greatest of the Anbiya. But they were humans like you and I. And they had the same inclinations that you and I have. The difference was that when they fell into the mistake, they sent back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they made, you know, truthful. And they made tawbah with their hearts, with their minds. Right? We fall into the same inclinations, but our tawbah is weak. Right? Even our return back, our regret is weak. It's half a regret. Right? But the stories of the Sahaba, there's, there's lessons for us to learn from this. So, what was it that held Ka'ab back? If there was nothing financially holding him back, physically that was holding him back, what was it that was holding him back? Right? From, for, for preparing. It's that idea of putting things on hold. Let's put it on hold. Sometimes we have no excuse in our path, but we put things on hold. Right? We think we'll be able to do it soon, tomorrow, tomorrow and until it becomes too late. And the same thing was, uh, this was the same regret that held Ka'ab back from joining the army and preparing for this. Now, Ka'ab says, this was my state. Until the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the day came where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he left in the morning and the army left. And Ka'ab says, I had not even prepared one thing yet. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whose habit was to leave in the morning, right, from Medina. Kaab says that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he left in the morning and I hadn't even prepared anything yet. But, but, the thoughts came, you know, the day is gone today, what I'll do is, how much distance is, an, is the army going to cover? The army travels slowly, it's travel slowly. He said, okay, you know what, I'll get ready tomorrow and they're probably going to go a few miles 
I just ride really fast and I catch up with them. Right? The next day, the same thought comes. And then the next day, the same thought comes. And then the next day, the same thought comes. Until Ka'ab bin Malik realizes the army has gone too far. And now it's very, very difficult for him to even try and join. The Ka'ab has a regret. Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu anhu, he says, I wish I had done so. Even if I was a week or 10 days or two weeks behind, I wish I had done so then. Why? Because it was, diff it was better for me to have covered the distance even if by, my, by myself and go through the difficulty and join them than to completely think that I've missed the opportunity. Now, this, this, the line of, I wish I had done so, is it not familiar to us? Is it not familiar to our ears? How many times have we said this same line, I wish I had done so? How many times, you know, have we heard people say, I wish I had done so? Right? People say, I wish I had joined. Uh, I bought Bitcoin 10 years ago, 5 years ago. Right? And people are in 20 years time, people probably, probably will say, I, I wish I bought it 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Right? The idea is that, you know, we regret, we don't know the future, we always look back. We always think the past was the great times. I wish I had joined then. Right? But it's never too late. Now is the best time to do anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to rush and jump on opportunities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It says, rush towards Allah's forgiveness. Rush, sari'u, be quick, speedy, run towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. And run towards Jannah, the, whose size is, the, the size is, it sizes the heavens and the earth. And it's been prepared for the believers. Allah is telling us, rush towards it. Don't delay. Why does Allah tell us to rush? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up opportunities, doors of opportunities for us. And when we show neglect, and when we show carelessness, we don't care about it. It's very much possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shut the doors of mercy for us. And never again will Allah give us the opportunity to do good. So if Allah tells us, now is the opportunity, and now we have the opportunity, if we neglect it, the, the chances are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could close the doors of mercy for us, and never again we go back. So people ask, you know, why one of the, a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person leads himself towards deception, towards misguidance, is by closing the doors of mercy upon himself. The doors of Jannah are open. The doors of Jahannam are closed in this month. All right? It's closed. Someone who wants to go into Jahannam in this month, and someone who doesn't want to go into Jannah in this month, has to make an effort. Normally we say we have to make an effort for Jannah. In the month of Ramadan, to go into Jannah is very, very easy. To go into Jahannam, you have to make an effort. Allah has closed the doors. If you want to go into Jahannam, you have to break the doors open. Right? With your actions, etc, etc. So Allah tells us, rush. Because if once the doors of the opportunities to commit good closes, then the chances are that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never open open up these doors again. And we understand also that the Muslim community at the time was accustomed to rushing towards goodness. When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa made a call, everyone would rush towards it. Everyone understood that this is my sacred duty. When Allah calls us and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa calls us, we have to rush towards it. Compare this to our own state. Right? When we need volunteers, we need some, someone needs help in the masjid, you know, or someone needs help at home, what do we do? We turn around the other way. Maybe someone else will do it. Oh no, you know, Nabil Ziyah, Kaleem Ziyah, they'll take care of it. We don't need to assist them, inshallah. They'll, do, they'll take care of all the cleaning. Rather, rather our state should be that we are putting ourselves first. We are putting ourselves first. Like the Sahaba, uh, the Muslim community at the time uh, was. Now the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he also told us Badiru bil a'mali sab'an Hurry and run and rush with your good deeds before seven things Before seven things happen Rush to do good deeds before seven things happen Hal tantaziruna illa faqran mansiyan Are you waiting for poverty, destitute that makes you completely mindless and forgetful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are going through difficult times, financially you're suffering, how difficult is it to concentrate on your ibadah? How difficult is it to say, okay, you know what, my income is going to be 
purely and solely halal. How difficult, when you're suffering, really, you're going through really difficult financial times. How difficult is it to stick to, you know, to leave the haram? And you know, even if the opportunity presents itself to say no, to say no to the haram, it's difficult. This is why the Messenger sallallahu said, "Kaad al yikun kufran." It's possible, you know, that poverty leads towards kufr. Why? Because when people are desperate, they end up losing and forgetting their morals, their ethics. People forget all this. So this is why the Prophet sallallahu said, "Rush if you have the good, you have the opportunity to good now, do it now." Because it's possible poverty could come and then you don't have time. Why? Because all your time is gone in trying to earn an income, try to feed yourself, feed your family. Some people, they are close to the masajid, they are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they have just enough, right? Or they're doing okay. But when Allah opens up doors of wealth for them, that wealth makes them forget. It, makes, it deceives them, right? So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa saying, is that what you're waiting for? Perhaps Allah opens up wealth. Like for some people, poverty is a test. So for other people, wealth is the test. Is that what we're waiting for? Aw maradan mufsidan. Are we waiting for uh, illness that we are going to live uh, till we get old? Aw mawdan mujhizan. Are we waiting for sudden death? Are we waiting for sudden death? That death will come. You know, uh, we have great hopes in life. We have great, um, uh, you know, wishes and things that we want to achieve, but we don't get to live. Right? People live the, as the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, live, not expecting to see the morning. Go to sleep, not expecting to see the morning, and wake up, not expecting to see the uh, the night. Can yani you always be prepared? So the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam encouraged the Muslims rush towards doing good. Don't wait for this. Now, Ka'ab bin Malik, he stayed behind, and the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he reached Tabuk. When the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam reached Tabuk, uh, he expected to counter the uh, the, Rome, uh, the Byzantine army, but he didn't do so. He waited in that area, made you know uh, uh, pacts with the local tribes and then waited about 20 days and came back without any fighting but while the messenger sallallahu alaihi one day he was sitting he was sitting with the sahaba and he remembered ka'b bin malik and he said what's happened to ka'b bin malik what, ha what happened to him? he asked the sahaba where is ka'b bin malik where is he what's happened to him a, a man was the sahaba from the tribe of banu salama he stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, his comfort, his wealth, his clothes, right, has, and his, his body has made him, uh, you know, he, he has detained him, he's kept him back. Meaning his comfort right, has kept him back from coming. Immediately, Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu anhu, he stands up and he says, what an evil thing you have said. What an evil thing you have said. And he turned to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and said, Ya Rasulullah, we know nothing about Ka'ab but goodness. We know nothing about Ka'ab but goodness. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said nothing and he kept quiet. Now there's a lesson for us to learn from this. First of all, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in this army of 30,000 people, he remembered Ka'ab bin Malik. The Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was exemplary in every regard. Even his leadership was exemplary. He knew he cared for the Sahaba, and he always thought of them. When the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he would um, uh, see someone's missing from the salah one day, two days. Immediately he would notice, and he would ask, "Where is this person?" And the Khulafa after him, they would do the same thing. Well, why is he not coming? And I'm sure our Imam. Uh, when he sees someone's not coming to the masjid for a few days, he'll know, he notices. And the same thing was with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He noticed a man who was always with him, Ka'ab bin Malik, he's missing, he noticed immediately. Right? What we learn from this is compassion, that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually cared for the Sahaba. Right? It wasn't the case that you know, they had to just blindly obey him, and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't give, they never received anything back. 
Rather, they received the attention of the Messenger they, they received the care of the Messenger Now, look at the response of the companions. One of the companions, he replied with a sharp and a quite a harsh rebuke of Ka'b bin Malik. Ya Rasulullah, he's been kept behind, he's been detained by the comfort. Whereas the mess, right? And then immediately Mu'adh bin Jabal replies to him and he defends his honor. We learn two things. The first Sahabi didn't say this about Ka'b bin Malik out of jealousy for him. He didn't say this because out of hatred for him. He said this out of his defense of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How dare Ka'b bin Malik? Doesn't matter who he is. How dare he stay behind from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How dare he not take part in this? And it was his, what he saw was a greater purpose that's why he criticized Ka'b bin Malik. In, in, in response, Mu'adh bin Jabal, he defended the honor of Ka'b bin Malik. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, we know nothing about him but goodness. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa acknowledged this, because this is what the case was, Ka'b bin Malik was. Now, we should be, first of all, we shouldn't rush to criticize and you know, uh, spread rumors about each other. In fact, we should be quick to defend the honor of the Muslim. As one of the rights of the Muslims is that we defend uh, another Muslim's honor. Uh, Imam Ghazali has a book, uh, a chapter in his Ihya al his famous uh, work, which is titled The Duties of Brotherhood. And he mentions what are the duties that Muslims owe each other. And he mentions eight duties. One of them is that Muslims defend the honor of another Muslim. We assist each other. We care for the Muslim, etc. But we on defend the honor of the other Muslim. We see uh, people getting hurt in Palestine and we feel the pain. But sometimes we see our own brothers who are next to us and we ignore them. It's really, really strange. That as Muslims, we think about all the charities going there, all our du'as are going there. We are talking about others that we perhaps we might never meet Right? But solely on the, on the basis of the bond of La ilaha illallah. And it's a, no, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's a great thing. And it's a sign of Iman. But sometimes our, those who are closest to us, sometimes they, get, they feel the most pain from us. They feel the most hurt from us due to our own actions. Rather, it's our duty as Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Muslim Mir'atul Muslim. The Muslim is a mirror of the Muslim. He defends... He stops people's hands reaching him. He defends his honor. Or something like this. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. The exact wording has escaped my mind. But, Mawr Ghazali mentions that Muslims, uh, this is what they do. And he mentions one of the signs of uh, the, the believer and the sign of the hypocrite. The sign of the believer is that he always assumes goodness about others. And all is in the believer's mind the good traits of other Muslims are present. Whereas in the hypocrite's mind, ye istra, ye istra, he's like this, he's like this, isme ye comes or ye, ye, he talks like this all the time. Right? Sometimes you meet someone full of negativity. All is thinking, no, they don't do like this, they, they, this much to do is like this, you know, he's got this word, he's, you know, his family is like this. Why, you, why do we do this? Why do we always have to bring in our minds the worst traits of others? Right? This is a sign of hypocrisy. Another sign of hypocrisy is when you see someone very, very harsh with Muslims over small debates, small differences of opinions, small fiqhi issues, right? small masail, and being very, very harsh with Muslims. Right? You do like this, you, you know, you, this is what you do being very critical of Muslims. And when it comes to those who are attacking Islam, those who are attacking Muslims, zip, quiet, quiet. Right? So, someone who attacks Muslims day in, day out, those who are attacking Muslims, stays quiet in front of them. This is a sign of hypocrisy. Right? The sign of faith is to defend the honor of your Muslim brother. Ibn Abdullah bin Mubarak, he said that the believer tries to find excuses for themselves while a hypocrite uh, uh, looks, for, uh, looks for someone's mistakes, for someone's other people's sins. Uh, 
and uh, this is what we find in the response of Mu'adh bin Jabal. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's sitting and he sees a, from far, he sees a figure, a white figure that appears. And he says, let this be Abu Khaythama. Abu Khaythama was a Sahabi. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he made a call out once for donations. That we need donations. And Abu Khaythama, he had a handful of dates that he came and said, Ya Rasulullah, this is all I have and this is what I'm going to donate. The hypocrites, they saw this and they started to laugh. Your handful of dates, your 10, 15 dates, what's that going to do? Is that all you're going to present? They began to laugh. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his response, he said, these dates are equal to, uh, you know, to, to a great amount of reward. Right? They are, it's more, they weigh more than anything that you will ever ever give anything that you will ever donate anything you will ever give these dates are more worthy so Ka'b bin Malik says now the Muslims they are there and the message news reaches them that the Muslims are, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the army is on the way back now when Ka'b he sees this and he hears this he becomes terrified right becomes terrified when your son's messing around at home and the mother says, yeah, I'm telling you, your dad's on the way home now. What happens? Suddenly he's the best behaved child. The best behaved child. All day, all night, messing around. As soon as he finds out dad's home, coming home now, the best. Right? Probably even starts cleaning up and start washing the dishes and you know, probably doing all sorts. The same was with Ka'ab bin Malik. He becomes very, very scared now. Because he knows that he has to respond, he has to, he has to uh, answer to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and ultimately he has to answer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now, Ka'b bin Malik, he was a human being, just like any of us. And the thoughts go into his mind, what answer am I going to give the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And the thought comes, I can give X, Y and Z response. This is a good excuse, this is a good excuse, this is a bad excuse, I will give this. And Ka'b bin Malik goes around, he and he consults everyone else, that what should I say to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And people are telling him, say this to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tell the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, you're the most merciful. Well, uh, ya, ya Rasulullah, please ask for my forgiveness. If, Allah, if the Messenger Sallallahu asks for forgiveness, you're, you're forgiven. Right? Just, just get the, on the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's soft side. This is what people are telling him. Right? Just get, just ask, once you ask the Messenger of to make uh, forgiveness for you, you're fine. And all these excuses are coming into his mind. Until Ka'ab bin Malik, he, he hears that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is outside Medina. And he's about to enter. And the habit of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, when he would come back from a journey, he wouldn't enter into Medina at night time. And he would he would he discouraged and one of the teachings of the Messenger Sallallahu is that someone's away from their family for a long, long time, don't just set, enter upon your family suddenly. Rather give them a notice, right? Give them some time to prepare themselves physically, clean themselves, you know, so you can be prepared for the wife can be prepared for the husband's return. So the same the Messenger Sallallahu said when he would come back and it was night time, he would just wait outside Medina until morning. In the morning he would go to the masjid, pray the salah and sit down. And the same thing happens. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes. He comes and he sits down. And the 80 or so hypocrites who stayed behind, they come to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one by one they are giving excuses. Oh Messenger of Allah, you know my wife was ill, my child was ill, Ya Rasulullah I had a headache, Ya Rasulullah my, my, you know, I had back pain, you know, uh, if I knew how to fight I would come, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the uh, Quran, if I knew how to fight I would come Ya Rasulullah, I didn't have a, a right, they give all the excuses. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he accepts this, says, okay fine, no problem, may Allah forgive you. They come, they present the excuse and the message, okay no problem, may Allah forgive you. Right? One by one, one by one, one by one, they all do this. And Ka'ab bin Malik, he had the same. I'm going to go and present an excuse. Ka'ab bin Malik says, When I came and I sat in front of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, any thought of making an excuse from my mind, it escaped. Any idea that I'll present some excuse, 
they run. I, there's nothing remain like this. Right? It says the idea that I could present an excuse, it just escaped me. He was incapable, he was unable to present an, an any kind of excuse to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to try to get away with it. And this is a truly a, uh, a sign of Ka'b bin Malik's faith and his true faith. Despite the mistake, Ka'b bin Malik was a true believer. He was a true believer. And it's only the true believers amongst everyone who stayed, who stayed behind that they were uh, they believed that if I lie now, if I lie now, I might get away temporarily. But I have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, sometimes, sometimes we find ourselves, we find some shortcomings in our actions and we have to answer for them. What do we do? We find some people who, are, who do, will not accept any kind of responsibility. We find some people who just want to blame the other. No, you did this, you did this. Always blaming others. Failing to accept any kind of responsibility. And sometimes we might even lie. We will make excuses. Right? Make lies up. But Ka'ab bin Malik, uh, it was his faith. It was his faith that stopped him from doing this. So Ka'ab bin Malik, he says, I came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I greeted him. And he smiled. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Ka'ab bin Malik. The Ka'ab bin Ka Malik said, Salamu Alaikum, uh, 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 Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled. But the smile was a smile of anger. It was a smile. Ka'ab says, he was smiling at me, but I could see anger in his smile. And all the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Ka'ab, why did you stay behind? That's all he asked him. Why did you stay behind, O Ka'ab? And Ka'ab bin Malik said, Ya Rasulullah, if I was sat in front of any other human being, if I was sat in front of any other person, I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the gift of argument, uh, arguing. Right? Allah has given me the, the gift of presenting my case. Ka'ab was a poet, very eloquent. Say, so, Ya Rasulullah, I could argue my case in front of anyone else and I can get away with it. But I know if I lie to you now, I will earn Allah's anger for eternity. Ya Rasulullah, I had no excuse. I had two camels. Ya say, Ya Rasulullah, I have no excuse. Right? You can just imagine this. That how much, how much of a difficult uh, uh, this scene must have been. How difficult this case would have been for Ka'ab bin Malik to open up and to tell the, uh, to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all he replied to him, he said, this one, he turns to the, uh, those around him, he says, this one, he's spoken the truth. Ka'ab bin Malik, he's spoken the truth. He said, get up, go, until Allah decides what he's going to do with, uh, regarding you. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all he said to him was, Get up, go, Allah will decide. And wait for Allah's decision. Now this also tells us one thing. When he came to, it came to the hypocrites, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, okay. He knew. He said, okay, that's fine. Go. Fine, go. Next, next. When it came to Ka'ab bin Malik, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, questioned him. He called, why did you do this? And then he said, he even testified, okay, you've spoken the truth. We also find this in our life as well. Sometimes when it comes to those who are closest to us, we want, we expect better from them. We have much higher expectations. From our own children, we have much higher expectations as compared to someone else's kids. Right? Because they're not our kids. Right? When our kids make a, those who are more beloved to us, they make a mistake, they do something wrong, or we can see that they're going towards the wrong path, we feel more pain. Whereas someone we don't care about, they can do what you want. Okay, it's, we know it's wrong, and you know, sometimes we might feel like, you know, we might feel slightly upset. Why are people doing this? But we don't have the same care. The fact that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he didn't just say pray for Kaab on the spot. He said, "Okay, may Allah forgive you." Right? 
the fact that he asked him, why did you stay behind? And he testified that he had spoken the truth, showed that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi cared about Ka'ab bin Malik. And the reason why he's doing this is because he expected much, he had much greater and higher expectations from Ka'ab bin Malik. This is why he did this. But this, uh, uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith, he says, Da'ma yuribuka ila ma la yuribuk. Leave what puts you in doubt and go towards things which don't put you in doubt. Things that you don't have doubt in. الصدق تمعنينا He said that truthful speech, truthfulness it brings peace, contentment وَالْكِذْبُ riba, And lying and lies they create doubts they create you know, suspicion and they lead towards all this How truthful is the saying that one lie leads to, an, to a hundred lies one lie, you speak a lie once, you have to lie a hundred times to justify this. You have to, you have to remember that lie, you have to keep lying again and again and again. Right? Whereas Ka'ab bin Malik, uh, he spoke the truth, he told the truth, he spoke the truth on the spot. Despite it being difficult, but he realized that you know, this is the only way for me to, uh, to, to uh, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to stop here and continue from this uh, in two weeks time uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to return to him may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the power of speaking the truth speaking the truth is, is really a, a very courageous thing that we can all do someone who wants to build self-respect you want to build uh, dignity and honor inside you right start from this point speak the truth if you can always speak the truth you will build self-respect inside you. Someone who can't speak the truth is very difficult to build self-respect. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to speak the truth. Jazakumullah uh, khairan for listening.